Okay, let's get started. Welcome, everyone, to the first invited discourse of this General Assembly. My name is Willy Benz. I'm the president-elect of the IAU. As you are aware, it is a tradition for the IAU to invite three eminent uh, scientists at every General Assembly to present insights into new developments in their field of astronomy. The invitation represents a way for the IAU to honor these outstanding astronomers and an opportunity for them to share with us all the excitement of new discoveries and accomplishments. I believe our first invited discourse is exactly in that regard. It is about the historic technical achievement that opens up new and unique scientific opportunities in many areas of astronomy. I'm obviously talking about the James Webb Telescope that was successfully launched in December 2021 on Christmas Day, by the way. Ever since we were biting our fingernails while waiting for the end of a successful commissioning and the unveiling of the first pictures. Wow is probably the word we heard most during NASA's release of these first images. Relieved, promises are kept, science can begin. To tell us about this, we are fortunate to have today Dr. Klaus Pontopidan with us. Those of you who followed the release of the first images by NASA will remember seeing Klaus telling us about how these first images have been selected and how he was excited about them. Who else but Klaus to share with us today some more insights about these first images and the very early scientific result from the data provided by this incredible facility. However, before he starts, let me say a few words about him. Klaus Pontopidan is a JWST project scientist working at the Space Telescope Science Institute in Baltimore, USA. In 2000, he majored in astrophysics and mathematics at the University of Copenhagen in Denmark and in 2004 obtained his doctorate from the University of Leiden in the Netherlands under the guidance of Professor Evine van Dyshoek, our past IAU president. After a year of postdoctoral work in Leiden, he was awarded the Hubble Fellowship to work at the California Institute of Technology. In 2010, he was appointed assistant astronomer and in 2012, associate astronomer at the Space Telescope Institute where he still works today. Klaus' research interests focus on the formation of planets and the origin of our own solar system. In particular, he is interested in determining how common ingredients for life, like water, for instance, are. For this purpose, he used data obtained from a number of space infrared missions, such as ISO, Spitzer, and Herschel. Today, a decade later, he is on the front of a very different machine. But I won't say more. I give the floor to Klaus. Please go ahead. Uh, let me go ahead and see if I can share my slides. All right, so that should look good. Um, so thanks so much for inviting me to, to give this presentation and, and for the opportunity to, to share with all of you the story of, of the first JWST images. Um, I, I do greatly regret not being able to be um, in Korea with you in person, but of course, COVID is, is still a challenge for everyone. Um, so anyway, let's, let's get started. So now I'm sure it's fair to say that, that we've all seen the first the first JWST images as they were released uh, uh, a few weeks ago, and, and and of course we have we have followed the the development of the JWST observatory for years, let's say through 
trials and tribulations. And 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 personally, um, I, I've worked toward this 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 end uh, for more than a decade. Uh, so it's been for me personally as well quite a milestone to see the end of commissioning of the observatory and the beginning of, of science operations. Um, so with, with this uh, presentation, I'm really hoping to give you some, some behind the scenes insight and stories about how, how we got to, to where we are. I mean, how we got to the science, um, what the, the very first, very, very early, and, and so with emphasis on very early, we're just starting, but the very early science with JPST looks like um, and also talk a little bit about how, how we, we made those first images that you saw in it and the thoughts that, that went into them. Um, so at, at this, as, as an IU General Assembly, I think it's also important to remind ourselves that uh, the JWST is an international project. It has contributions from North America and Europe, but we also think of it as, as sort of the world's telescope. And this is similar to, to Hubble, that uh, anyone can propose to use it. Um, and then we support a, a public archive of data uh, where, where all the, the, the data from JWST will eventually become public, but also that about a quarter of the, of the data that are taken during the first year and, and presumably going forward uh, are immediately public for use uh, by anyone. Um, and this, this is true for across a wide range of, of science areas. So I think we're already seeing the benefit of such public data sets. Uh, so that that everyone uh, you know who, who's interested in working as data can get up to speed quickly um, and and be able to successfully propose for for more time and we have many years of science operations ahead of us uh, which which also means of course a, a, an immense amount of of public data so let me start my story going back to to that Christmas morning last year um, uh, a very very early morning launch was. Uh, for us anyway, a launch was scheduled at, at 7.20 in the morning, uh, Baltimore time, where the Mission Operations Center is. This is a, a picture I took um, uh, on, the, on the morning of the launch, um, almost uh, three hours before launch, uh, coming into the Institute very, very early on this cold, cold morning. Um, so because of, of there was a big COVID uh, wave at that time, we had a much smaller event at the at the Space Telescope Science Institute than originally planned. So, so, so few, few people um, uh, were were there to witness the launch, and and we didn't have a we didn't have a photographer even on site. So I was actually running around taking you know brought my camera and I took pictures of what was going on here. So just a sort of a few impressions from from that morning. Uh, you see on, on the top left the the, the wavefront control uh, room console. We have Marshall Perrin there with his uh, his. Uh, uh, elf hat. Uh, you see uh, our deputy director on the right, um, uh, Nancy Levinson, and uh, and the mission head, Marsman Stiavelli. On the bottom left, you may recognize Heidi Hamill uh, and Garth Illingworth. And and of course, as we all know, we had a, we had a perfect launch. We had a we had sort of a textbook launch uh, provided by Ariane Space. Um, and, and so it, it, let's say we, we call this a, a good day. <clears throat> so. I'm not going to spend a lot of time going into uh, the deployments and commissioning of the observatory because I was a I was a spectator for that. I was waiting for my uh, sort of part of commissioning my responsibility, which which was always uh, to to help create those those first images and get the science going here. But I think it's worthwhile to to consider. The, the the incredible technical achievement of that commissioning going from the say going from the image of the left where you see an unfocused image of a single star um, from each of the 18 segments of the primary mirror going to the right image where the the mirror is aligned uh the the telescope is phased and in this very first alignment image we already see what kind of potential there, there is what kind of scientific potential it was because behind this bright star that was used for the alignment, you see this field of of, of distant galaxies emerging, uh, and and this, these these galaxies they emerge immediately almost with this observatory, uh, even you know in short exposures they come out, and so immediately, uh, you know, when when we saw this image, we knew it was like we, we knew we knew we had a very sensitive infrared observatory, but seeing it. 
uh, so viscerally uh, was 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 really an experience. <clears throat> so, um, in the final after deployment, in the final two or three months of commissioning, uh, this is when it, it started to become uh, more more personal for me. I was more personally in, in, involved in that because this is when we uh, we. Uh, commission we, we made ready the, the four science instruments and uh we had the opportunity to to start measure what the science performance was you know do, do they actually meet the requirements and were we able to do the science that we have been waiting for for so long um there's a there's a fairly extensive report already um led by jane rigby with more than 400 co-authors and everybody who was uh, who was involved in, in in commissioning and you can find that on astro ph um, and it gives you all the details of this. So I just wanted to give you a little bit of a summary of, of what was in there. Um, I think the key takeaway here was that that the science performance of JWST is better than expected across the board. Um, and, and, and this was not a given. I mean, this, we, we, I think everybody was actually surprised to 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 see how how, how good this really is. I mean, it's, <laughs> can this really be true? But but really, you know, when you have four different science instruments, four different teams, they all look at this and independently, and and everybody came back with this message, like, yeah, you know, we're actually kind of better than what we thought. Uh, you know, we're detecting thin galaxies down to a few nanogenskies. You know, for, for those who think in magnitudes, that's AB magnitudes less, uh, fainter than thirty mag. Uh, we can track solar system objects uh, at least twice as, as fast as we thought, or at least as was the requirement. Um, for, for exoplanet transits, we, we meet the requirements to and, and, and the expectation to do this fantastic exoplanet science. And, and now, of course, all this, all the 17 science modes have been checked out and they're all ready for science and they're, they're, they're actually taking science data on a daily basis. Um, Everything was deployed and performance as expected in terms of thermal performance. Um, the observatory cool down, this is something we watched for months. It took a, it takes a long time to cool an observatory like this, an infrared observatory, it has to be cold. Um, and it's something we watched very carefully, but it really matched predictions very well. Uh, the secondary mirror is cooled to just over 29 Kelvin. And, and there's a span of, of temperatures in the primary segments. Um, Sort of an interesting little bit of, of uh, a little bit of fact is that in the bottom four panels actually produce most of the thermal background, and you can see you can see here some some about eighty percent of the thermal background actually comes from those those bottom four primary mirror segments uh, that are closest to the uh, the spacecraft bus and the sun shield. Um, the mid infrared instrument, which 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 is the only mid infrared instrument. Um, uh, successfully cooled to, to just over six Kelvin using a closed cycle cooler. Right? So it doesn't have um, uh, liquid, it doesn't have cryogen that ex that's expendable. Right? It, doesn't, it doesn't cool by evaporating helium or anything like that. It's a closed cycle cooler, so it can go for a long time. And what is it, what is close to my heart is that, that we, we uh, have not detected any accumulation of ice on any optical surfaces, which was otherwise a concern and, 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 a, and a big part of, of, of how, you know, to avoid that was how the, the, the cool down was, uh, was designed. Um, so we don't see any of that. Of course, if you have ice accumulating on the optical surfaces, it makes hard, much harder to detect molecules and astrophysical objects. So uh, it's better than, than predictions even. So there's actually a bonus improvement in sensitivity at three micron where you have a strong, uh, otherwise a strong absorption band from water ice. In terms of optical performance, uh, it's also excellent, uh, better than expected. So NIRCAM, which is the, uh, the instrument that has the, the uh, the, the highest strill ratio, the best optical quality has a wavefront error of between 60 to 80 nanometers um, in, in science performance terms. That means that we're diffraction limited at about one micron. The requirement was to be diffraction limited at two microns. So in some sense, we're twice as good as, as we thought we'd, we'd be. Um, and so it really means excellent uh, wavelength quality, almost all the way down, down to the lowest uh, range of the wavelength um, that the observatory can, can uh, see. Um, and, and, and changes in this over time are small and they get corrected for regularly. Um, so here's another one at that, that just, this kind of blows me away, right? So this is just the raw point source sensitivity for, for near cam. Um, the, the requirement, uh, and this is 10 sigma sensitivities in 10,000 seconds, uh, was uh, about 10 nanogenskis. And, and in actuality, we're about 20 or 30% better than that. And so that translates in terms of speed, in terms of time it takes to reach a certain depth. 
it's much faster. Um, and this is this is due to some combination of better throughput. So throughputs were estimated a little conservatively. It's a good thing. Uh, detectors have a little lower lower read noise uh, than, than expected, and we actually have lower backgrounds uh, from scattered light. So, so light that 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 comes from other parts of the sky and the way you're looking at that gets reflected off of different bits because we don't have a baffle, right? We don't have a tube of the of the observatory like Hubble has, and so some of that scattered light gets scattered into the line of sight. But we have less than that than than what the models predicted. So overall, an improvement of of twenty or thirty percent in sensitivity. All right. So so with with all that in mind, we got to a point where uh, you know uh, if we were in a, in a really good place. Um, and then the next step uh, that came along is that, well, we have to get to the end of commissioning. And as part of that, we have to demonstrate that to the world that JWST can do uh, amazing science. And this is a, a task that had been planned for years and years. Um, and, and this is where, where, um, uh, where I had responsibility for, for this. And so basically, we we're chartered to, to do this, like show the world that, that JWST does amazing uh, science. Uh, and so this is uh what we call the uh the early release observations uh what in the public has been called first images uh and spectrum and so early release observations is something that is that is very uh, commonly done with observatories like this so hubble for example had early release observations after uh after servicing missions um but many other observatories they have this first release just showing that we, we can do science so the charter is to create spectacular images that are worthy of a flagship observatory like like, like Hubble and $10 billion. Um, uh, we have four science instruments, and uh, those four science instruments include contributions from significant partners, the European and Canadian space agencies, as well as, as NASA. So the, the, the early release observations had to include observations from all four science instruments and highlight these contributions. And we had to cover the, the, the major science themes of web. And so in the end, we had five release, uh, five images um, in spectra. We had an exoplanet spectrum. Uh, we had an image of a star forming region. We had an image of a planetary nebula, interacting galaxies, and, and a deep field. Um, and so, so that spans that spans that range of science. There, there's some some omissions there that will come later. Uh, you know, one thing you can think about, for example, is, is solar system science. So there was an early decision that um, we were too worried about being able to do that. Actually, it turns out we probably could have done 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 a good job there. But anyway, that that will come later. And you have already seen a beautiful image of Jupiter, for example. So. Uh, we realize, of course, there's, there's more to this than, than science, right? There, there's a, this is where there's a juxtaposition of art and science, right? Because the audience here is, is, is the, it's a world, it's, it's a worldwide public, as well as the science community, right? So, so we, we cater to both with this. Um, and so one of the things that we've been thinking about for a long time is, and, and, and you know, we have experience with Hubble to do, how to do this, is what makes a stunning astronomical image you know something something that really captures a public audience um and there's a few considerations to have here i actually took i'm showing this image here of an ant um that is uh, that is tending to an aphid farm uh, so this is a picture i took uh, out in our backyard so i take inspiration from from regular photography like this but this is not or, or this is not even just regular uh, photography right this is macro photography um uh, which in in many many cases is a bit alike to as, uh, to astrophotography in the sense that you take images of something that you can't immediately see with your with your naked eye and, and you can make discoveries and you can make stories that are just not apparent right so the first thing is we have to have a story it has to be a science narrative um another aspect of making a beautiful image is um is is information density um so again it's from the, from the point of view of the public Right. So you, you have to draw them into something and you can explain the science later. Um, and so this is something that translates into how many how many uh, pixels, how many beams do you have across your image with useful information? Right? So just something that creates a detailed um, image of information. And as part of that information, also, you have a, you have a color gamut, right? You have to have color in there. Um, and I think one of the things you see with Hubble images is that the, those, those color images have this natural appearance. Although 
uh, it's not something that you would see with your human eye if you went out there and, and looked at a certain uh, picture of a nebula, even if it's taken at visible wavelength. It, it looks like it could be. Right? That's meaning it has a natural appearance. It doesn't have a fake looking appearance. Um, and that's something that that come that can come naturally out of out of an image, but is not a given. Um, uh, you have to have contrast in there, so it's, it's just a photographic uh, aspect of it, right? You have to have contrast in the color. We're looking for that. Uh, we're looking for contrast and brightness, right? If you just have a, you might have have a lot of uh, stuff going on in your image, but if you don't have a good uh, brightness contrast, it doesn't draw you in as as a as a as a photograph. Um, you have the texture. Uh, so uh, you might have have large scale structure. But you also have small. You have to have small scale structure, and you have to have some sort of crispness to to the image. And then, as regular photo photographic technique, you have to have framing, right? It can be natural framing, which means that that you have you have your your object in the in the center of a view, but there's a dark frame around it. Um, so it's just you have to find an object that has the right size, and you have to create your field around it so that you get a frame. Uh, you can have leading lines in it, um, so we'll see an example of that. Uh, you can look for pairs of triplets of objects, um, and you have to have some sort of balance. You can't have all your stuff in one corner of the image just to be balanced balance across it. And it has to be a surprise and discovery, of course. I mean, when you go out and take an image with something like DataVST, what are we going to see? Uh, and so this was, of course, a challenge for us as well, because you know, there's just no way for us to know what, you know, how the images actually would look like until we've, we've taken them. Um, all right, so I just want to acknowledge that that making the first images was a real team effort. Um, it was it was done by 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 this interdisciplinary uh, team at at Space Telescope with uh, that consisted of uh, scientists, uh, visual artists, science writers, and so on. And this was, um, I, th I think, re really one of the most talented and dedicated teams I've ever had the, uh, the the privilege of working with so so they you know we owe all, all of this to 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 those folks um so they created the images so the targets themselves were selected and prioritized by a different um group of people it's called the ERO committee which had representation from from NASA uh ESA CSA um and space telescope and of course we also recognize that everything we do uh, we could only do because uh, of all the foundational efforts in building, you know, and the thousands of people who built this observatory and made it work. Um, so the the early release observations were obtained um, through the month of June. Um, it it was uh, quite the the interesting process to do because we we were under this this very tight deadline. Um, we knew that. Um, uh, you know, we're basically told, you know, don't don't spend any more time on this, and you absolutely have to because we need to, you know, we need to get the data out to the public, we need to get data out to the community, we need to start uh, science operations. So it's not something we could spend months and months in doing. So we had an extremely tight tight schedule. So we had sub teams that worked in parallel uh, on all these different different products. Um, uh, one of the things that forced us to or made us do, what, which I think is a really good thing in the end, is is that you know you couldn't have a serial process, right? We have that team of, of more than thirty people, as I mentioned, um, and so basically <clears throat> every day we had that whole team come together, um, and it allowed us to to see the images for the first time here. And so the, this image here is, is actually there's a real image of of us looking at one of the images for the first time um, on, on on my laptop. Um, so we, we we would look at the images for the first time, and 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 you and the writers would 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 get to listen first listen to scientists, you know, sort of in real time discover or discuss what it is that they saw, and of course you know you don't know what you see, right? So there's some interesting discussion about how we try to figure out, you know, what is this, and then, you know, let's look at it more carefully and let's try and figure out what's what, what's going on. But then you know soon everybody just joined in in on on this discussion, you know, regardless of whether you were had a had a science background or a science communications background or even visual artist. So so it was a fantastic experience to just see this interdisciplinary team come together like that. So we met daily like that for six weeks, um, you know, through the weekends, holiday, whatever, um, to to create those uh, those final uh, products. Okay, so let, let's just get into them. So you all seen the images here. So I just wanted to to give you a little more background in 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 you know why they're made the way they are, and you know some of the things that we ran into. 
Um, so start from far to near here. So this is the uh, the deep field, which is a which is a, uh, a massive galaxy cluster called S max zero seven two three. Um, uh, and this was chosen, of course, because it has um, it has arcs from gravitational lensing. Um, it would you know which 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 creates a uh, you know something that's visually attractive. Some, uh, that is the science story to have have as right? so we can talk about gravitational lensing, and also because of course it enhances, it brightens the light from galaxies behind um, and makes makes distant galaxies more more easy to see. Um, a note here, and this this goes for all the images, is that uh, the observatory that was that I used uh, generally for all of them. Uh, to frame the images and to to simulate what we'd see, um, right? Because it's important to, to 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 simulate to to get the right exposure time and not just the uh, the, the field. Uh, it was Spitzer. Spitzer was really the observatory that we used to do this. Um, and you can see on the left hand side, you can see the Spitzer field here. Um, the 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 deep field that we released, this Max field, um, is is actually only half of the data here from near camp. Because NearCam has two different modules that are, redund that are you know, internally redundant, but looks at slightly different parts of the sky. So you get this parallel field as well um, that is off the cluster, right? So you both have a deep cluster field, but you also have what, what is, I guess, more traditional, a more traditional astronomical deep field where there's just nothing there. Um, <clears throat> so that's available as well. Um, and we did a MIRI pointing uh, on the on NearCam field, uh, but the, you know, it will only cover. Uh, part of the part of the near camp field because we went for depth rather than than um, coverage on the sky. Um, so when 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 we did the deep field, um, I wanted to to well, you wanted to have a deep field. Right? Once 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 I started to do um, sensitivity calculations, it quickly becomes apparent how fast this telescope is, and so in just a short amount of time. You you reach in the wavelengths where you overlap with Hubble the roughly of the deepest Hubble fields in just a couple of hours. So we knew this, um, and so it was it was designed to roughly match the depth of the Hubble ultra deep field at uh, at one point six micron. Of course, once you or you're belong, beyond that at longer wavelengths, you go much deeper than anything has been done before with Spitzer or, any, or anything like that. Uh, but we wanted to ma roughly match the Hubble ultra deep field because we were more sensitive, as I like, but 20 to 20 to 30 percent more sensitive than we thought we were. We actually go a bit deeper, we think. So uh, uh, we should reach um, AB magnitudes of 30 or a bit, bit beyond um, and around one to, to four microns. So that was a bit of a bonus that, that we really get this very, very, very deep field. We already see results in the literature that, that indicates a, a very high redshift galaxy candidates. Um, so I just wanted to have, you know, I'm sure we have all zoomed in on these here, but it's just one of the things that just really struck me in this was just, was not necessarily the depth, but also the sharpness, right? And so this is what you get from that imaging quality um, that we now know that we have. Um, so some of these magnified lens galaxies, it's high, highly, uh, highly magnified. Um, you start to see and resolve out these, what I guess is, is massive uh, star clusters um, and so these galaxies have redshifts of one and a half to two or something like that. Uh, but you really start to to get a, a, a completely different appreciation of star formation in these in these different in these, these distant galaxies than you just couldn't get get with Hubble. So not just sensitivity, but also this this this, this uh, the imaging fidelity and the, the the image resolution to resolve these star clusters. I have not seen those before. Um, and you can actually see in, in some of these, like in the left hand side, you can see sort of point sources scattered through it, which is which is probably star clusters in the lens uh, galaxy, uh, you know, whether they're globular clusters or something else that we don't know yet. I'm sure lots of people are, are looking at, at, at this, uh, this data set, which is uh, public. Um, I'm also struck by, so here we have the MIRI image on the left and the near cam image on the right. One of the things that you you'll see in all these MIRI images, uh, the distant galaxies that pop out there, is that they have these almost primary colors, like they're red or they're green or they're blue. Um, and uh, I guess we don't know for sure, but we're quite convinced that that this is because you're seeing are you seeing pH bands in these distant galaxies that sort of shift in and out of the filters depending on redshift. And so 
if you're looking at a certain filter, uh, there might be a pH feature in it, there might not be. But if there is one, then, then that filter completely dominates the color of the galaxy. And that's why you get these, um, uh, these, these colors. It looks, like, it looks like some kind of candy or something like that. And that's just, it's just what it looks like. I mean, this is, no matter what you do. Um, so I found that striking. Um, so one of the other things that we, we managed to do here, which I, I, maybe this is the one thing I'm most proud of, um, is is our ability to 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 do follow up spectroscopy of these distant galaxies with near cam multi object spectrometer. So here it's used to demonstrate um, how to the public and it's a public outreach product how astronomers translate uh, redshift into look back time, uh, and how we can track uh, the what, what essentially is the the hydrogen beta line and the oxygen three triplet. Uh, through a wide range of different redshifts and every different different look back um, times, but the uh, at the same time this kind of quality spectra at redshifts out to eight and the, the eight and a half, which is the, the most distant one, and this one <coughs> is um, is just a, it's just astounding. And people are already taking that there are actually many more lines than when you just what you see here. And so for the first time, you know, just just in the spectroscopy that we were able to do. Uh, you can start to measure metallicities of galaxies, uh, you know, at redshifts eight and and, and beyond. Um, and so I can only imagine what kind of uh, science can will come out once uh, uh, we get much more near spec spectroscopy. It's really a fantastic instrument um, for this. It was a struggle for us to do it. Uh, we actually had to try four times <laughs> uh, to get this because the uh, the target acquisition for for the near spec MHA, which is which is a uh, um, it's a com very complicated mode. It was not quite ready for prime time yet, so we sort of were trying to do this at the same time that they were fixing the last, the last issues with it. So, but fourth time was the, it was a charm for us, and and we managed to get the spectrum in um, uh, just in the, uh, around July first, just uh, you know about uh, ten days or so before the the release actually had to happen. So this happened very fast. All right. Um, so going a little bit closer. Uh, so here we have the the, the Stephens Quintet images. This, is, this was our largest image, 150 megapixels. It turns out, I mean, I was surprised by this. I mean, there was a lot of concern early on that that we shouldn't do big mosaics with near cam. It wouldn't look. It would be too difficult to do. It wouldn't look good. It turns out that you can actually do mosaics, large mosaics with near cam, relatively easily. Right. So 150 megapixels here is actually uh, six tiles uh, with near cam put together in six different filters. Um, and still going very deep. I mean, you can see the, uh, the the incredible richness of the distant galaxy field in this. What we actually what we went for with this uh, was was of course not just the galaxies, but also that uh, uh, the all the Spitzer features um, you see to uh, uh, to the left, right? All the red stuff, which is pH emission. Um, it turns out that if you're the, the near cam the, or the image on the right is both near cam and miri so it's a composite putting putting them together if you only look at the near cam image on its own uh, nearby galaxies actually sort of tend to turn up um featureless mostly because you're just you're seeing the old stars and the dust has gone away and in hubble wavelength you see dust in nearby galaxies and that, that produces interesting structure but in the, in the near infrared it goes away uh, so only once you add the mid infrared, where you see the pH emission, that's when you get the, the the contrast you need for a public outreach image, and that's why we we tend to combine near cam and MIRI when we're looking at uh, at uh, at nearby galaxies. Uh, the MIRI image is, uh, is is really really stunning, though. Um, to show that in the, in the next slide. Um, Yeah, so let's just let's just jump to that here, just because I, I think this is this is this is stunning. So, um, we, with with Miri because it has a smaller field of view, right? We don't get the nice rectangular image, um, unfortunately, uh, for for public art. So uh, there was there was some worry about you know you know you don't want you want to have a a rectangular image, but um, you know it, it it was too time consuming to do that. In fact, originally I had set this up to only have two tiles along the um, uh, Along the two vertical galaxies, right? So that's NGC seventy three nineteen and NGC seventy three eighteen. Uh, but when we realized that we had to combine near cam and mirror to get uh, this visual uh, effect in a combined image, 
we actually went back and we added the leftmost galaxy, which is actually not part of Stefan's quintet. It's a it's an interloper. It's a much more nearby galaxy that just happens to be along the line of sight. So we went back and added that that later. So that's why you see the position angle is a little different uh, on it because the the observatory um, had uh, had rotated a little bit um, in between. But I think altogether it it creates a stunning stunning vista. And you can see on the top, you can see the bright point source there. So that's an AGN. That's a C for two core in in seventy three uh, nineteen. Um, and we went for this. You can see the green along the edge. That's a, that's a shock front in in the collision of those galaxies. Um, that is that has a lot of H two emission in it. So we wanted to to see if we can get that as well. And so you can see that marked out here. Um, this the the AGN of course was a tempting spectroscopy target using the uh, integral field units to get that spectro imaging. Um, and so here, for example, is, is the near cam, oh, sorry, the near spec IFU uh, observation of the C for two core. Uh, when you this, this is PSF subtracted, so we subtract the, the bright a bright point source from the AGN, and then what you reveal is the structure from the from the jet from the AGN that is otherwise completely blown out in the in the images. And we see uh, we see hydrogen recombination lines as well as molecular hydrogen. It's interesting here that we, the, the, the left mode, the atomic hydrogen, that's actually a H alpha line that normally we don't get, but it's just redshifted enough that we get it into the range. And so we get, we get the H alpha in the, in the, in the core here. Um, and we can also use the, uh, uh, the AGN to illustrate the richness you get in the mid-infrared. Um, and so here we have the, the MIRI integral field unit, the MRS, uh, with spectra obtained at, you know, from the, from a cube, right, obtained at different positions um, you know, on the AGN itself and off. Um, and you see on, on, the, uh, on the AGN itself, you actually have, have a lot of, you probably have a lot of star formation around it. So you get a lot of molecular hydrogen in. Whereas uh, when you go off and you look at the jet, you get a lot of highly ionized lines. And so, so all the, the, uh, the, the um, atomic lines you see, they're actually highly ionized. Uh, but it's incredible richness. And you see silicates in absorption here. All right. So uh, the Southern Ring, um, it's, uh, this was, a, I, I was really happy about how, how this turned out. It's actually, a, it's a challenge to, um, to find good planetary nebula uh, to observe in, in the first images because they tend to either be too bright or too faint. Some of them are really bright and much too bright for JWST, but the Southern Ring here really fell in, in a good spot. Um, uh, and as, as you can see, and you can see how, how it was framed relative to the uh, to the Spitzer image. Um, and there's an interesting juxtaposition here in color as well between the near cam image, near infrared image on the left, and the mid infrared image on the right. Um, but there's physics in this as well, right? <clears throat> so on the left hand side with near cam, you have a uh, uh, the, the ionized inner cavity, which is here traced by passion alpha, and then all the brown stuff or the reddish, reddish orange stuff around it, that is a molecular hydrogen, the S9 line uh, that, that creates most of that. Um, and that is where you get an incredible amount of turbulent structure in that line emission. Uh, and I was really actually surprised to, to, to see that. Uh, and then on the, on the right-hand side with the mirror image, you, you get the opposite cause, but that's because the uh, the ionized region that's traced by um, by sulfur three at, at uh, around eighteen micron. Um, uh, so it's the same thing as passion alpha, but it's just the colors are different because it's a much much redder line that we're using there. And the the, the blue emission around it is no longer H two; it's uh, it's polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons that we're tracing there. Um, so so you get the opposite colors just because you're using different different tracers. Just to just to zoom in, look at a little bit of detail in the Southern Nebula because I think it's really it's really worth it to do that. On the, on the right hand side, what you see is this incredible structure in the in the H two emission. But then once you go to a little bit larger distances, you see this streaky, the streaky structure. Um, so we don't think that this is a real physical structure. We think this is crepuscular rays, right? So that, that the, the, the light from the, the bright star, which is actually not the progenitor of the nebula, is shining through this very patchy material. And so you get shadows projected uh, on the outer part of the, of the nebula. And so you, you see that in, in, in great detail here. Uh, 
And of course, on the left hand side with, with JWST, you always have these interloper galaxies that uh, that appear everywhere you just see through the nebulae. And it's, it's, there's that perfect um, edge on galaxy you see on the, on the edge. All right. Um, so the Carina Nebula. So this one was, uh, uh, I think it was my favorite before we 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 even we even took the image. Um, this this was a case where I really I really I really love this kind of uh, sort of landscape image, and we wanted wanted to have that. But we had a second reason for designing it in in the way that we did. That was there was this narrative going around with JWST and infrared images uh, that you may have seen where. Um, where you know we say that Hubble takes takes beautiful images of star forming regions, but once you go into the near infrared, you see through the dust, and so the nebula turns into this wispy stuff, and you see all the stars behind, which is which is true up to a point, but only in the very near infrared. And once you go to just a little bit longer wavelengths, especially once you start to pick up non thermal uh, emission from PHs, uh, for example. Um, and and as we've seen with, with uh, in the mirror images too. Uh, uh, star forming clouds into the clouds they, they just they just light up you get this kind of fireworks so so we wanted to have a real demonstration of that and something that's nearby nearby enough to show a lot of structure um and i'll show that, that a little bit later here so 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 th this this incredible sharpness of the uh, uh, of this of the landscape of the cloud here is designed from the use of of ph uh, filters tracing is very very thin surface layer in a PDR you know, in a photo dissociation region so it's done deliberately that way um, you can see on the left hand side how it was framed relative to to the Spitzer image uh, with JWST because um, of um, of the fact that you, you you need to always keep stay in the shade with with the sun shield you can't let the mirror be exposed to sunlight uh, there's a for, for most areas of the sky, there's a very limited um, position angle range that you can pick, and, and near cam has this very elongated field of view. Uh, so in this case, it was actually it was set to the, the, this exact region that it was also because uh, that is that was the position angle that we would get at the time we, we observed it. So it's just an interesting side note. Um, so zooming in on the Korean nebula here, you can really see the the, the, the in the left hand side the the sharpness and this thin the thinness of the, of that uh, of that layer, um, and it's created by shown in the next image. It's created by using a three point three micron pH filter. That is really what creates that that texture. Uh, shorter filters, indeed, just you see through the cloud, and that's why you can see stars through. You can see you can see stars above it, and you can see stars in you know through the cloud as well. Um, and the, the pH layer just adds that, that texture. On the right-hand side, it's also my favorite. So there's a protostyle outflow, there are multiple protostyle outflows in this here. But you can sort of, you can almost see how, in this case, you have sort of an up-down outflow, how it's constrained by the cloud going down, but upwards, uh, it, it has emerged from the, from, the edge of, from the edge, from the PDR, from the edge of the cloud. And you can almost, Get a feeling for sort of this a puff of cloud. <laughs> I, I don't know if it's it's really uh, dynamically related to the outflow here, but it, it it's it looks like that. Uh, and there is a there is a Herbie Carroll object all the way to the top of the field. It's not in in this image here, but you can actually see the end of the outflow much much larger distances when it's unconstrained by the uh, by the dense cloud below. Yeah, so so I just wanted to show. So this is the uh, the pH for the three point three uh, micron filter with near camp on its own and you can really see how how it, it that ph is such a thin thin sheet above the cloud um yeah. and i thought i think we're going to use for, for public outreach image we're going to use this filter a lot just because it create you know any kind of star forming region is going to create um this kind of structure especially if they're nearby all right so last but not least um the exoplanet spectrum um Again, this was a challenge for us because we had so little time. Um, and of course, uh, when you're doing an exoplanet transit, it happens at certain times. So you only get like one or two opportunities to observe a given planet that, you, that we wanted to have and be able to process the data and be able to make an exoplanet spectrum with features in it. So it was really a tall order, but <clears throat> we, we, um, we, we obviously we succeeded in doing this. It was actually the second attempt. Uh, we observed another one. There was another one that was released. It's had P18b. Uh, 
uh, that one we observed with Neris uh, as well, uh, but it we we turned out we couldn't use it. So Neris um, in its exoplanet transit mode uses uh, a, sort of a defocusing piece of optics that spreads the, uh, the starlight out on, on, on many pixels to be able to look at transits from very bright stars that would otherwise be too bright to do. Uh, but because of the, uh, of the spreading out of the light, it's much easier to get contamination from other sources in the field. I mean, it's a, it's a slitless mode. Um, so there are always contaminants. In this case, there was a contaminant that uh, we assumed had stellar colors that would, you know, start stellar colors means it gets much, much fainter in the infrared. Turned out it wasn't like that at all. It was a very, very red source. I'm not sure what it is actually. When, you know, somebody can go back and look at it. It might be a galaxy or something like that. I don't know. But it, it had contaminated the, uh, the first exoplanet spectrum. So it would be much too much work to, to try and get rid of it. So actually, we went back to the telescope and observed another one, sort of a plan B that was WASP 96B. Um, in any case, uh, you get these beautiful uh, transit light curves here. Um, it, it almost comes out of like comes out like this out of the box, uh, which I'm told is, um, is, is 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 really unusual for this kind of data. So this was all done by by Nestor Espinosa, who uh, you know, did a fantastic job on this. And of course, the spectrum of it was designed to be a spectrum that has strong features in it. So these are all strong water features um, from a very puffy hot Jupiter. Uh, but clearly demonstrates uh, the ability of, of JWST to, to see um, features in transiting exoplanetary atmospheres with a precision better than 100 parts per million. So it's really, really the purpose of, of this. Uh, again, data public, and I'm sure um, the folks uh, in the exoplanet community are looking at this. All right, so, so th those were the first images here. So, so let me just... Uh, say just a few, few brief words about all the other things, right? Because this is what we're seeing now is, is actual science, right? So the early release observations were never intended for, for us to do science with them. Uh, they're, they're done in a very careful way um, of, of interesting objects. So I think there's a lot of science in there and there's already publications coming out, especially from the, from the deep field. And, but at the same time, there's lots and lots of other data being taken. So we only scratched the surface there. And one of the things to highlight, for example, is early release science program, which is a program that was designed to get public data out quickly. Um, and so are these 13 programs. And most of them, all the yellow ones, have um, data taken already, uh, available in the archive. They're not complete yet. There's one complete one. Um, and there's one program that has, doesn't have any, any data yet. But we, we're, we're very, very actively taking data from these early release science programs spanning a wide range of uh, scientific topics um, from, from the distant universe all the way to the, uh, to the solar system. Um, and so I encourage anybody who's interested to take, take a look at those. They, the, the, they, those data sets are really meant to, to get everybody up to speed uh, to understand the data from JWST uh, in time for, to propose for cycle two, um, with, which will have a deadline in January next year. Um, and, and apart from the, uh, the early release science program, there's also other programs that are public. So, so I just wanted to highlight this, these fantastic, beautiful images from the FANG survey, which is a treasury program, which is a different type of, of public program. Um, it's led by Janice Lee. Uh, nearby galaxies imaged with, with Mirians, just amazing to see this. You see the spiral structure of the star forming regions, and you see these big cavities in there, for, presumably from... Uh, from, from, you know, from supernova explosions or something like that. Um, you know, there's lots and lots of science to do with that, but it's just, it's just absolutely uh, stunning to see these come out. And so we, we didn't do this. This was, uh, this was done, uh, this is a composite as well done by uh, Judy Smith. And I think it's just been fantastic to, to see how, because there's this public, all these public data sets to see the community and the public just dig into them and come up with and find things and discover things along with, with everybody else. So again, it's the world's, it's the world's observatory. Um, and some, 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 some more sort of specific science results here. We've seen a lot of that in the literature here. Um, uh, not a lot has been uh, uh, refereed yet, so we're looking forward to see uh, you know, refereed papers in the literature too, but we see lots of things on AstroPH in particular with high redshift galaxies. We are learning that high redshift galaxies for, uh, uh, grow and, and become mature at much earlier stages than we thought they were. People find these, uh, these dropout candidates in the 
in the public fields is the Sears ERS program, as well as the, the deep field and, and other fields. There's not a, a glass field, for example. Um, and we're just picking up these galaxies at redshifts of 14, 15, 16. Um, you know, just emphasizing that they're candidate galaxies because, um, you know, always need a spectroscopic confirmation. Uh, and we don't have that yet for these. Um, but I'm sure that that these this will be you know some some of the more common proposals for cycle two to get spectroscopic confirmations of some of these really super high redshift candidates. But we're learning a lot about the the early universe, and it's fantastic to see the enthusiasm in the in the community. Um, so just uh, uh, this is a couple of pictures at the very end. So when we're when we're done with all the uh, the early release um, observations and we're ready get ready for the release, I I was fortunate enough I got the opportunity to. Sort of deliver them and and uh, explain them here to uh, this is NASA administrator Bill Nelson and associate administrator for science uh, Thomas Zubokin. Uh So this was this was just before they uh, they went to brief the uh, the president and and the vice president of the United States uh, on the, on these images because uh, President Biden wanted to to be the the person to to release the very first image, which was the the deep field, which I think is what I'm holding here. Um, and of course, he famously he he did that uh, on the day before the actual release. Um, it was a bit of a surprise for us that they wanted to do that, but it was it was an honor for us to to uh, to, to see the president um, do that um, and, and release the uh, first image. Uh, but um, to me, uh, I think the the you know of all the 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 of all the attention and all the all the talk about the. The first images, uh, the one I was happiest uh, to see was when uh, when Mark Hamill, you know, who's Luke Skywalker, was my one of my childhood heroes. Uh, uh, tweet about um, the the deep field, uh, so it came full circle for me because it was you know, from my childhood, and I was I was able to do that. So so it was uh, that that was what 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 makes me made me the happiest. Um, all right, so so with that. I just wanted to conclude here, um, talk about the future. We have begun regular science observations. Um, uh, we have handed over a lot of public data to the world. There's thousands of scientists. Um, we have, I mean, we can see in our metrics and our downloads that they're being downloaded by the terabyte. Um, you know, uh, a lot of folks are, are looking at the data. Uh, watch out for more public data from the early, more early release science pressure programs. Um, we want to highlight that, um, I mean, there's of course guaranteed time as well, but the solar system community had their guaranteed time. They have, they have uh, made all of that public as well. So any any solar system observation you see, almost all of them um, from the guaranteed time program, uh, those are public. Um, and so, so just want to thank them for doing that. Um, you can, of course, you can access the science data through the uh, Mikulski Archive for Space Telescope at mass.stci.edu. Uh, webtelescope.org is is the uh, website that will contain all the public outreach products. NASA has has it too, uh, but there's this little more content content on webtelescope.org, um, more different options and so on. Um, and visit jwst.stsi.edu. This is a website for scientists, for, for for news, for observers, observing schedules, uh, calls for proposals, and so on. And uh, let me just just end with. Uh, this came out yesterday, um, uh, so we we have we are going to continue to put out um, images. At first, we you know more just, just image releases, and we, while we're waiting for refereed results from the um, from the scientific community, um, and when we have scientific results, we'll put that out. But this came out yesterday. This is a, a mirror image of the Cartwheel Galaxy. Uh, you see again, you see the star formation, you see the ring, and you see it uh, on top of this background field of these of candy galaxies that we'll see everywhere with uh, with Miri. So I'll just leave it at that and um, be happy to to take any any questions. And thank you so much for your attention. Thank you, Klaus, for. Uh, sharing with us these uh, emotions that are behind these first images and all the thoughts that went into them, uh, not just scientific, but artistic as well. And I can just imagine what a relief it was for the whole team when, when everything worked so well. Uh, congratulations and congratulations to all the team. Uh, we, we have a few minutes here for questions. So there are two microphones in the aisles, I believe, or there are microphones uh, that you have 
to grab. Yeah, they are here and there in the two aisles. So please, if you have questions, line up behind the microphones and uh, don't hesitate to ask your questions. I, I don't see a big rush now. Uh, don't be shy. Yeah, here. Jürgen. Well, well uh, let me start. Jan Christensen Dalskor from Aarhus University. This is wonderful, and congratulations, of course, on these fantastic results. Uh, having been on the SPC for many years, the ESA Science Program Committee, actually seeing this come out is, is a, a big relief and a big, a big day also for me. Uh, just one technical question. One of the worries about the instruments was with the micro shutters in, in the near spec instruments, because that's a very uh, delicate thing to launch into space. So is that working as, as, as it should be? Yes. Um, yeah. So my understanding from the from the near spec team is that um, uh, it, it, the micro shutter array is working exactly as it was uh, expected to be. Uh, of course, um, there at launch, one of the things that they were looking at was uh, you know due to vibrations is you know, how many of these how many of the shutters would uh, would break or have problems. Um, uh, because as you say, it, it is very delicate and they find that it's actually, it's only a very, very small amount and, 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 a, and a, a long expectations of, of, of changes in, in the number of inoperable shutters. Wonderful. Thank you. Yeah. I remember during the presentation of these images, uh, the, the, we're saying how many critical systems and how many point of failure there were, they were in the hundreds. So, uh, it, it's just amazing how, how that deployed and, and works nicely. Any other questions? All right. Seems, yeah. Can you please go to the microphone? Uh, you mentioned several most distant galaxies. Uh, what can you say about the internal structure of the image? Uh, is there some structure inside the image, or this are uh, just slightly larger than the point source? Um, yeah, so I think I think so far the uh, the those very high redshift galaxies uh, are um, in the available images right now don't have necessarily a lot of internal structure. But what I would say is that. They're based on images that only took um, maybe an hour or maybe two hours to obtain. So again, I would expect proposals for future cycles, trying to go much deeper on them to reveal any kind of internal structure in them. And the, the observatory is perfectly capable of it. So the first step is to find them and then characterize them and look more, much more carefully at the most interesting candidates. Yep. <clears throat> The, the <clears throat> temperature of the primary mirror segments has uh, 20 degrees variation. And I, I saw the, uh, that it has a little bit of gradients. So the uh, top part is uh, cooler and the, the bottom part is uh, a little bit hotter. So does it affect uh, to the image how much? I mean, so yeah, so the image quality is does, is not affected by the temperature of the mirrors, but the the lower, the hotter uh, segments, the lower four ones account for most of the thermal background. Um, so it's dominated by by the few hottest hottest segments, but the imaging quality is, is the same, and that's um, and that's you know in large part also thanks to the fact that we ha we're having active optics, so each each segment is. Uh, um, has seven degrees of freedom for uh, for alignment focusing. So, um, so yeah, the temperature is in effect. Thank you. Yes. Yes. Uh, thank you for your talks. Uh, I have uh, two questions. Uh, many people are asking us to how they can make the color so yellow and blue and red because it is the uh, infrared instrument. So, uh, do you have any basis basis for the putting the color? I think it's a pseudo color. So, 
people asking us. And the second thing is, uh, you mentioned about the, the first image team. Uh, so they including the writers and the artists. So what's the, their roles for the first image? Okay, so, so for, for the first question, um, for, the, for the color assignment, we generally use what we call chromatic order so that the, uh, the blue color is assigned to the shortest wavelength and the redder colors are assigned to the, to the redder wavelengths. Um, and of course, within that, you can, you can adjust um, things a bit, but we do try to, to make the color gamut natural, uh, keeping uh, what we call white balance. Uh, so, which, which is sort of an e even weight between the different um, the different color channels. Um, so that's sort of the very the very brief explanation. But the chromatic order is something that's enforced throughout throughout these. Um, the role of the writers and the visual artists, and obviously the visual artists were uh, are the ones who, uh, Giorgio Pasquale and Lisa Pagan, are the ones who actually um, put the color images together and, and, and create those final products, right? They, the scientists, which deliver um, you know, grayscale FITS files to them. Um, writers, uh, uh, so for the early release images, uh, they were all accompanied by, uh, by press releases and write-ups. So the writers would, would, would write those. Um, and so that, that, was their, that was their role. So everybody has what I had an e equal role in then discussing how, and, and, and there was feedback between the writers and other folks about you know, what, how we're showing the images. Uh, you know, and, and, and which 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 images to pick, and so on. You know how to tell that story. Yes, thank thank you. And then, uh, is there any serious conflict with the scientists and the artists, according to the Carlos? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, again, there there is a right. The, the, it's a juxtaposition of science and art, right? So it's not ju only art. Uh, we're using the images also to. Uh, to, to tell a science story, um, right? So, so which, which is why, for example, if you look at Stefan's Quintet you, you, or, or any other nearby galaxy, you add the, uh, the Miri images, not because, only because it, it gives you um, a more aesthetically pleasing image, but also because it shows um, different physics. It shows where the star forming regions are, it shows where the, where the, where the interstellar medium is um, in the image, and you can use that to tell the story. Okay, unless there is a burning question, I think we have slowly reached the end of our time. Yes, one more. Yeah, hi. Uh, so I wanted to ask about this micrometeorite strike and uh, if there is a worry that uh, this can also limit the age or the time span over which JWST can work. Yeah, so... Uh, um, Micrometeorites is, is, is a fact of life at L2, and so the uh, regular strikes by micrometeorites is something that's always been taken into account in the observatory. We actually get a hit, a noticeable hit, um, uh, about once a month. So, so it's not there's, there has been more than one. Uh, the difference is that there was one that was larger, or at least more energetic, could have been faster too, than, than what the models predicted. And so we only had one of those. And so, um, of course, there's a concern because it didn't match the models um, that if we had many more of those that can over time degrade the mirror faster than what was uh, predicted. But on the other hand, you know, there was only one, so maybe we just got unlucky. So this is something that's being studied very carefully right now. Um, there, are, there are potential ways that, that could be mitigated as well. Um, but but um, given that we've only been hit once, it's clear it's not something that is super common. So. So we're looking at that very carefully, and and um, you know over the years maybe we'll we'll do something. Okay, thank you, Klaus. Uh, I would like uh, to conclude here by saying that uh, I believe we're all convinced of uh, what kind of science we can get out of this, but I think the power of images goes way beyond science. And for a meeting like this General Assembly, where it is astronomy for all, I think the images will, will be something extraordinary also for the public. And I noticed you had a lot of outreach programs lined up and a site for that and, and, and things. I remember my neighbors came to see me 
regularly about images they saw in a newspaper about Hubble, Hubble images, went long ways into attracting people to astronomy. I think here we have a second example of these sorts of things that will happen. And I think uh, for us at the IAU, with our efforts in trying to, to reach out to the public, I think this is a great facility. Thank you again and congratulations.